Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we are thankful for that song that you started singing. And today we're going to find out that Mary was one of the first to sing that song. We pray that you'll keep us with open and receptive minds and hearts to receive the word that your spirit will implant on our minds and hearts today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Have you ever thought of Mary, the mother of Jesus, being a revolutionary? Has that thought ever crossed your mind? She doesn't seem to fit into that category, does she? When the angel Gabriel comes to her with the announcement that she is going to birth the Messiah into the world, she responds in a very submissive way, May it be to me as you have said. And then Mary makes a visit to her cousin Elizabeth, who is pregnant and expecting the birth of John the Baptist. And when Mary greets Elizabeth, Elizabeth exclaims these words, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. And when Mary hears these confirming words from Elizabeth, she bursts out into a song. And the words of her song are the words that Charmony read for us today from Luke 1, 46 to 56. Now this song itself has been called the Magnificat. And Magnificat comes from Italian words meaning glorify or magnify. And this Magnificat, this passage of scripture, holds a very important place in church history. For over 2,000 years, it has been sung by Christians all over the world. Unfortunately, those of us in evangelical circles do not sing the words like they do in the Eastern Church in particular. But in other branches of the church, it is sung almost every Sunday, People recite it in their homes, and Bach set it to music on Christmas Day in 1723. Well, some wonder, well, how could Mary, she was just a teenager, how could she have written such momentous revolutionary words? But we must remember that Mary grew up in a religious home. There she would have learned the scriptures, and many of the thoughts that are in her song come from the Psalms of David, and in particular in Hannah's song when she was pregnant with Samuel. And so when we read the Magnificat, we are reading the words of the Old Testament through the eyes of a young girl who has been chosen by God to birth the Messiah into the world. One other point deserves mention. Besides this being the very first Christmas carol, besides being the very words of Mary, besides being steeped in the Old Testament, the Magnificat is one of the most revolutionary documents ever written. Dr. E. Stanley Jones, that missionary statesman to India, wrote, the most rev this is the most revolutionary document in the history of the world. Quite a statement, and you're probably wondering, how can that be? Well, these words of Mary's song speak of a Messiah coming into the world who is going to bring a complete reversal of our ordinary human values. She is singing this song, to, the, to, to God, whom she personalizes as her Savior, and who is going to turn the attitudes and orders of society upside down, morally, socially, and economically. Mary's song consists of two parts. The first is her personal reflection on God's word in her own life. And Mary speaks in the first person, and she blesses God for the mighty things that he has done in her life and for the people of Israel. And she is humbled 
by the fact that God has chosen her to birth the Messiah into the world. And so she sings, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble estate of his servant. She doesn't feel worthy of such an honor, but she accepts this gift humbly, and she accepts her role in God's plan for the redemption of the world. Then at verse 51, we move into the second section, and this is the revolutionary part, because it is here that Mary addresses the prophetic promises of Christ's ultimate work to establish his kingdom and to bring about a reign of righteousness. And she expresses the changes that the coming of Christ is going to bring as though they had already happened. And the changes that he will bring are revolutionary they have the power to change the world. So Mary's song includes three revela revolutions of God, a moral revolution, a social revolution, and an economic revolution. Martin Luther says that the Magnificat comforts the lowly and terrifies the rich. So are you going to be comforted today or are you going to be terrified? Well, when we look at the ministry of Jesus, we might be led to ask, where did Jesus get these concepts from? And after reading these words that Mary writes, we realize the profound influence that Mary must have had on Jesus and the kind of ministry that he would have. So first of all, his birth will bring about a moral revolution. She sings, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. So when Christ would come into the world, he would perform many, many mighty deeds. And I think Maury, uh, Mark Lowry expressed it well when he wrote the song, Mary, did you know that your baby boy will someday walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? The child that you've delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm a storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? And when you kiss your little baby, you have kissed the face of God. Oh, Mary, did you know? The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again, the lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the Lamb. So that's the greatness of this Jesus that Mary prophesied about. But Jesus would also expose the hypocrisy and the pride of those who think they are righteous in themselves. The sinner who acknowledges his sin leaves the temple justified. But the self-righteous man who comes in thinking, I'm so good, I do all these things, he leaves the temple empty. Because any kind of pride we have separates us from other people and also separates us from God. Because we must be humble before God. And when we align our lives with Christ, we realize that there is so such a difference between his life and our life, and some we have to bridge that gap. But when we align our lives with Christ, his spirit in our lives will bring about a revolution. A great change will take place. In his book, 
songs in waiting, spiritual reflections on Christ's birth, Paul Gordon Chandler writes about Yusuf, whom he met in Cairo, Egypt. Yusuf lives in a large slum just outside the city of Cairo. It is where several thousand garbage collectors and their families live. It's a filthy area. There's pigs everywhere, and the smell in the desert heat is almost unbearable. And yet several years ago, Father Saman Ibrahim, a Coptic Orthodox priest, decided to move into that forsaken area and share the gospel with these garbage collectors. And the people worship in massive caves that are carved out of a rock hill. Through that ministry, they have developed a school, a vocational training center, and a medical clinic. And astonishingly, every Thursday evening, some 13,000 people gather to worship in the large carved-out amphitheater by the garbage dump. It was here that Paul Gordon Chandler met Yusuf. Yusuf was an apprentice with his father, learning how to be a good garbage collector. We've heard of people being apprenticed for a lot of things, but did you ever think about being an apprenticed garbage collector? Well, one day, Yusuf found a gold Rolex watch. It was at a construction site, and it was dropped by an American executive. Because Yusuf was a follower of Christ, and the message of Christ had penetrated his heart, he felt that he wanted to find the watch's owner so that he could return it to him. And this watch, this Rolex watch, was worth more than he would make in his entire lifetime. It was worth more than $20,000 on the Cairo black market. But he did his search. He searched for months. He asked questions about who was the owner of this gold Rolex watch. And finally, he learned that the man who owned this watch, who had lost this watch, lived in a luxury apartment building in downtown Cairo. So he went to the building, and he knew that he would not be allowed into the lobby of that luxury building. And so he figured out a way to get into the building through a place where they took the garbage out of that building. And so he was able to get in that way. He climbed up the stairs to the floor that this executive's apartment was and knocked on the door. When the American opened the door, he was surprised to see someone in the hallway looking so shabbily. How did he get in here? But Yusuf says to him, you lost something? You lost something? And the American, he, he, it had been several months now, and, and he couldn't think of why he was being asked that question about having lost something. And so then Yusuf dug into his uh, cloak, pulled out the gold watch, and he says, did you lose this watch? Well, when he showed him the watch, the American invited him into his apartment. And then he asked him, why didn't you keep this watch for yourself? Well, Yusuf replied, Jesus taught us in the Gospels to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what belongs to God. But the American says, why didn't you take it and sell it? He said, it's not mine. It's not right. I must be honest. It's not my watch. Christ did not steal. So you must be a Christian then. Yusuf said, yes. Miraculously, that American who had described himself as an agnostic, 
renewed his faith in God that day because of the example of that revolutionary teaching of Christ being followed by that poor garbage collector's son. Later, that American wrote in his diary, I came back to God because of a poor Egyptian garbage collector in Cairo. What a beautiful example of the moral revolution that Mary spoke of in the Magnificat, Mary's song. Second, his birth will bring about a social revolution. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. The liberation theology movement in Latin America used the words of the Magnificat as the basis for their revolution. They felt that they had biblical support for overthrowing unjust governments and to bring justice and equality in the name of Christ. So the Christ of whom Mary sang is a revolutionary Christ. He would bring about a complete reversal of human values. It isn't the mighty, the proud, or the rich who will have the last word. And just think even the last few decades, how many great and powerful leaders have lost their positions. Complete downfall. Idi Amin, Hussein, so many others. So Mary's words speak of social justice and affirm that every person is of equal importance before God and that every person receives God's love equally. So her son would put an end to discrimination, no stereotyping of people, no putting labels on them. Christianity knows nothing about worldly labels and prestige. William Barclay, in his daily devotional commentary, writes about a man named Muritus. He was a wandering scholar in the Middle Ages. He was poor, and in an Italian town, he fell very ill. And so, because he was poor, they sent him to a hospital that was for waifs and strays. And the doctors were discussing his case in Latin. And they never dreamed that this poor man would be able to understand. So they suggested that since he was just such a, a worthless, poor wanderer, why don't we use him for medical experiments? Well, then Miridas looked up in perfect Latin and said to them, call no man worthless for whom Christ died. Because of what, of what Christ has done, we can't divide people by class or social standing. We are equal at the foot of the cross. There's no big eyes and little eyes. We are equal. But sometimes we have the feeling that because we have attained more, we have more wealth, more prestige, better jobs, better health, that makes us better than other people, makes us superior. And so it's very easy sometimes even unknowingly to look down at others who are going through difficult times. And we kind of think, well, if they had made better decisions, they wouldn't be in that place that they are today. And maybe that's true sometimes. But that gives us no reason or excuse to look down on people because they have less than we do. Did you know God has a special place, a special compassion for the poor and the powerless? In our devotions, Dean and I have been reading the minor prophets. And if you think that God isn't concerned about the poor and the powerless, read the minor prophets. So in Mary's song, 
she could see that the coming of Christ would also break down the walls that would separate people, not just by class, but by race. The proud, arrogant people would be brought down, and those who are put down will be raised up. And we could look at South Africa as a good example of that. Well, in the early days of the Church of God movement, racial segregation was legal. And how was the church going to deal with that situation? Listen to how they dealt with it. So his birth will bring about a social revolution. And third, the birth of Christ brings an economic revolution. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. This is another part of Mary's song. Wherever the gospel has entered a society and made an impact on a significant group of people, it has always affected those people and lifted them up economically. This has happened across the world. Whenever the gospel goes into the poor and disenfranchised, it raises that group up in society. I want you to listen to a story now from Donna Cox. Donna is involved with a Church of God organization called One Heart. It's in Dayton, Ohio. Every week, this group, group of ladies, make delicious food, and they serve it in the dressing rooms of strip clubs. You heard me right, strip clubs. That's where they meet with women who are being trafficked or are at high risk of being trafficked. 
And as they share their stories, the Christian women at one heart counsel with them. They give them any help they need to find social organizations that can help them. And they help to put fractured lives back together and give them the courage to dream again. Here's Donna Cox. Well, Church of God traffic light is to help people who are caught up in the trafficking. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Every 30 seconds, someone is forced into modern day slavery. 27 million people are enslaved in the world today. One million children are exploited by the global commercial sex trade each year. The average age of entry for women into prostitution is 12 to 14 years old. Every year, $37 billion is made off the backs of slaves. Human trafficking is the fastest growing criminal industry in the world. So the birth of Christ brings an economic revolution. You see, the, revol the transforming power 
of our Lord Jesus Christ is amazing. When you look at Charlie, here was the life that was lost and wasted, abused, with no hope, and life now to a life of purpose and fulfillment. And in her story, we see all three of the revolutions that were in Mary's song. They are all three fulfilled. There was a moral revolution. Charlie's life was completely transformed by the power of Christ and by the love of those who took an interest in her. There was a social revolution from an outcast to an insider, to being a child of God. And then there was an economic revolution. From needing support to being a contributing member of her society. Such is the revolution that takes place as the Christ of whom Mary sang is allowed to do his work in our world. So it is true. The gospel makes better people, and better people make a better world. A world where the powerless are cared for, where the hungry are fed, where the oppressed are liberated, where the sick are ministered to, where the unlearned are taught, and where the lonely do find a family. The gospel works not only on inner transformation, it also works on outward transformation that literally changes the way people think and talk and act toward each other. And in the process, the economic lives of people are lifted as well. The gospel is the only hope for mankind not only for his soul, but for his body, not only for the church, but also for the world, not only for the individual, but also for society. And when the gospel makes headway in society, there you will find peace, harmony, tranquility, and ultimately prosperity. Countless numbers of people across the world have been transformed and revolutionized by the Christ of whom Mary sang. Will you be a part of what God is wanting to do in the world today? Will you be one of God's change agents making a better world? Will you help in singing Mary's song, a song of revolution? When Mary was invited to participate in God's restoration plan for the world, her response was, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me, as you have said. What about us? Let each of us say with Mary, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. I will be a part of your transforming, restorative work in my world. A song that helps us to affirm that is the chorus, Sanctuary. Lord, prepare me. <laughs>